you for coming. Thank you for doing this. You're wonderful. <laughs> so today I'll be talking to you about the history of glaciers and the Catskills. Uh, glaciers uh, bulldozed and shaped the Catskill landscape into what you see today. And I want to begin this presentation by taking a look at this historical map of Catskill glacial deposits. Try and get to the next slide. Oops. Oops. That. There we go. <laughs> okay, so this map was created by the renowned Catskill glacial geologist John Rich. And in 1934, Rich published his research findings in a paper titled Cats, or glacial, glacial Geology of the Catskills. His paper is still referred to by Catskill geologists today. And I'll be reviewing many of Rich's theories and observations in today's talk. And this image is a zoomed in section of the map that Rich published in 1930, following his extensive research mapping the sediment of the Catskills that were left behind by glaciers. And each type of glacial sediment is marked by a different color. And circled here are the west and east branches of the upper Neversink River. And here are the upper Rondout Creek. You'll notice to the top right of the map that the Ashokan Reservoir is mapped, but the Rondout and Neversink Reservoirs seem to be missing from the map. And this wasn't a sloppy mapping mistake. The Ashokan Reservoir finished construction in 1915, but the Neversink Reservoir did not begin construction until 1941, and construction of the Rondout Reservoir didn't start until 1937, long after Rich published this map. So Rich didn't forget to draw in these structures, they just simply didn't exist when he was mapping the area. And I think that this is map is especially useful because it reminds us of a key principle of geologic history, which is the landscape is constantly changing and what we see across the Catskills today is not always how it once was. The Catskill Mountains are located to the west of the Hudson River and the region is protected within the Catskill Park and Forest Preserve, which spans approximately 287,000 acres. The underlying bedrock of the Catskills, specifically their structure, fractures, and dipping layers provide the foundation for the Catskill mountain peaks that hikers enjoy today. And this is a hand-drawn map by Rich, and he's identified four major escarpments of the Catskills that are still here today. And an escarpment, for anyone who's unfamiliar, is a long cliff-like edge, or ridge, I'm sorry. These ridges or escarpments drastically influence the unique drainage patterns of the Catskills. The present day hiking trails along the escarpments also provide countless beautiful overlook views that Catskill hikers enjoy. And this is a map of the Catskills that you might be more familiar with. Uh, you can see how the Catskill landscape juts out. It's much more jagged with higher peaks than the surrounding area. And I used the descriptions provided by Rich to map the rough locations of the Catskill escarpments onto a Google My Map document, which you can see here. And this gives you a better sense of where the Catskill escarpments are. So the Northeast Ridge stretches along the Blackhead Range. The Eastern stretches along the Wall of Manitou. And the Central escarpment spans from Indian Head Mountain to the town of Stamford. And the southern escarpment stretches from Ashokan High Point past Slide Mountain. These ridges or escarpments have a powerful influence on how water flows across the Catskills. They also have a tremendous impact on the behavior of glaciers that moved across the Catskills. So the next time you're hiking along any of these marked areas, be appreciative and be respectful of the bedrock geology that allow our scenic cliff edges to exist. And it's easy to catch a beautiful view off of our cliff edges in the Catskills. Today, the Catskill region is a forested landscape with gentle rolling mountains bursting with life. But the Catskills didn't always look like this. Geologists have compared the landscape of the Catskills during the Ice Age to 
Greenland's ice sheet, which is shown in this photo here. And roughly 20,000 years ago, almost the entire Catskill region was a frozen wasteland. It was a time of ice and rock as the barren Catskills were covered by a massive moving sheet of ice estimated to be approximately 3,000 feet thick. And this ice feature is known as a glacier. The United States Geological Survey defines a glacier as a large scale perennial accumulation of ice, snow, rock, sediment, and liquid water that forms on land and moves down slope under the influence of its own weight and gravity. Glaciers form through a simple, gradual, long spanning process. When it snows for a long period of time, the snow on the ground begins to build up. The snowpack gets extremely heavy, puts downward press pressure on the underlying snow. Over time, this process packs the snow and turns it into ice. As snowpack accumulates over a long period of time, the ice layer gets thicker and a large glacier is formed. And glaciers can become thousands of feet thick. And due to the massive pressure that the ice is under, the glacier ice starts to behave like a plastic. And you can see on the diagram here that within the glacier, there are these plastic zones where ice can bend and flow in multiple directions without it breaking. And this means that glaciers have the ability to slowly morph their shape as they flow downhill. And glaciers flow similarly, similarly to how a thick tar would flow across the landscape. And sometimes geologists compare the flow of glaciers to how pancake batter would flow across the landscape. So snow piles up in one location, sort of like the center of the pancake, and then the ice accumulates and flows radially outward from the center. And I think that this is a useful image to keep in our mind as we talk about glaciers moving across the Catskills. So depending on climate fluctuation, on climate fluctuations, a glacier has the ability to grow and shrink in size. And when glacial ice develops faster than it melts or evaporates, the glacier will expand or advance. And when the glacial ice melts or evaporates faster than it forms, the glacier will shrink or retreat. And when the rate of ablation, which is the rate of uh, the loss of snow or ice by melting or evaporating, when ablation is equal to the rate of formation, the glacier appears to stay still. So basically, glaciers are in a constant balancing act of snow accumulation and snow loss, and they're constantly changing their size, expanding or shrinking or staying the same, depending on these factors. So even as a glacier retreats or shrinks, the ice and sediment still flows down slope. Glaciers act like a conveyor belt, transporting sediment, rock, and debris down slope. And as a glacier moves across the landscape, whether it's advancing, retreating, or at a standstill, its ice and meltwater can erode, transport, and deposit massive amounts of rock and sediment. So as they advance, glaciers create massive erosion. Their ice grinds and scours and plucks rocks and debris from the surrounding landscape. And as they retreat, they can create major deposition. They drop the sediment that they were carrying. Glacial erosion and deposition are very complex processes as glacial ice and meltwater have a variety of impacts on the landscape. And glaciers have this ability to bulldoze valley walls, they can create massive lakes, they can reroute streams and drop massive blankets of sediment. So glaciers have literally shaped the Catskill landscape into what we see today. So how, when, and where did glaciers move across the Catskill region specifically? Glaciation is a highly complex topic and research on Catskill glaciation is ongoing. So when I was studying the academic papers and journals published on the subject of Catskill glacial geology, I found it very helpful for me to create a timeline of events. And I compiled research offered by John Rich, Donald Cadwell, and Bob and Joanna Titus and organize their findings into a timeline of events. The following slides tell the story of Catskill glaciation according to their findings. And this is just an extension of that. So the world experienced an ice age from roughly 1.2 million years ago to 11,000 years ago. During this ice age, glaciers covered most of the northern half of North America. 
25,000 years ago, a continental sized ice sheet known as the Warrantide Ice Sheet expanded and it eventually spanned from present day Long Island to the Ohio Valley along the Missouri River to Canada and then stretching west to the Pacific Ocean. And the figure on the right shows the maximum extent of this Laurentide ice sheet in North America. At this time, there are no signs of life in the Catskills. There's no evidence in the fossil record of human, animal, or plant life living at this time. So the Catskills were a frozen, lifeless wasteland. The ice sheet expanded from three central points located in Labrador, west of Hudson Bay, and the Canadian Rocky Mountains. And these center points were huge mounds of snow and ice where snow continued to accumulate, causing the glacier to slowly spread outward. Again, uh, it's helpful to picture a pancake flowing. The glaciers affecting New York State spread from the colossal Labradorian ice sheet, the center of which was estimated to be approximately 10,000 feet thick. During this time, the Catskill region was scoured by massive glaciers, and this was not a smooth process. Glaciers advanced and retreated multiple times across the entirety of the Catskills, carving and molding the landscape. These advances and retreats were the result of significant climate fluctuations, referred to as glacial episodes. And it can be difficult to determine exactly when glacial episodes begin and end. The geologic evidence of older glacial episodes can be erased by the erosion and the deposition of more recent glacial episodes. And the most recent glacial episode that affected the Catskills is the Wisconsin glaciation. Many geologists consider the Wisconsin glaciation as the most influential glacial event on the present day Catskill landscape. And during the Wisconsin glaciation, the continental ice sheet or continental glacier advanced and retreated several times. And in the later stages of the Wisconsin glaciation, the continental ice sheet expanded from the Northeast, eventually arriving at the Southern border of New York state, which you can see in this map here. And again, remember, this is the ice sheet spreading out like a pancake from its center in Labrador. And geologists refer to this stage of glacial expansion as the Woodfordian glacial advance. During the peak of the Woodfordian glacial advance, almost the entire Catskill region was buried beneath this enormous glacier estimated to be approximately 3,000 feet thick. And to give you a sense of scale, uh, that ice was about as thick as 10 Statue of Liberties stacked head to toe, and it was all weighing down over the Catskills when the glacier scraped and scoured the landscape as it expanded. So the enormous ice sheet advanced across the Catskills. It flowed like a thick tar building up against the high elevations of the Catskill escarpments. And at approximately 22,000 years ago, the continental ice sheet scrapes past Slide Mountain, which is the tallest peak of the Catskills. And scientists have debated whether or not Slide Mountain was completely buried by ice at this time or if it was a nunatak. A nunatak is an isolated peak of rock that sticks out above the surface of inland ice. And again, the story of Catskill glaciation is complex and scientists continually collect new data to examine past theories and improve our understanding of Catskill glacial history. Then around 21,750 years ago, the Woodfordian glacial advance reaches its farthest extent. The continental ice sheet expanded to its farthest point along the southern border of New York State and for a while, the glacier remains at a constant latitude. So as it lingered, the glacier dropped or deposited a tremendous mound of sediment, rock, and debris that it had been carrying. As I mentioned earlier, glaciers can act like a conveyor belt, continually transporting and depositing material. When a glacier stays at one location for a long period of time, a massive mound of sediment and debris is deposited at that location. And geologists call this mound of sediment a moraine. Moraines that are deposited as a glacier pauses during retreat are known as recessional moraines, and moraines that are dropped at a glacier's farthest advance line are known as terminal moraines. So during the late Wisconsin glaciation, during the Woodfordian advance, the continental ice sheet reaches its largest size. It drops off a massive terminal moraine 
creating the backbone of Long Island, and then the Continental Glacier begins to slowly shrink, an event referred to as the Woodfordian Retreat. So the terminus or end edge of the glacier shrinks back northward as the ice sheet melts and evaporates. As the receding ice sheet meets the mountainous terrain of the Catskills, it becomes difficult for the ice sheet to uniformly recede. Like we saw earlier, the Catskill terrain is much more rugged than the surrounding area, and along the coals or the gaps between the mountain peaks of the Catskills and the mountain valleys, things get especially messy. In several valleys along the cliff edges and the high peaks of the Catskills, many smaller localized glaciers temporarily remained long after the, long, the larger continental glacier melts away. And several Catskill valleys become jammed with ice during the Woodfordian retreat. The continental ice sheet recedes at different rates across the mountainous Catskill landscape and several distinct recessional ice margins occur. So what's an ice margin? An ice margin is this boundary between a glacier's outer edge, also called its snout, and the land. And this land is also known as the proglacial zone. So these boundaries are where the glacier paused during retreat and left behind mounds of sediment known as recessional moraines. And geologists can track the movement of past glaciers by identifying and mapping the present day landscape features formed at ice margins. Rich was one of the first geologists to identify distinct ice margins across the Catskills. And these ice margins, along with other landscape features, tell the story of how Catskills, of how the glaciers exited the Catskills. This map is incredibly detailed and Rich recommended using a reading glass for those examining this paper map. And I'm sure that Rich did not intend these maps to be looked at on a PowerPoint slide through a webinar. So instead, I'll be using zoomed in versions of this map along with other Google Maps, which should hopefully be easier for everyone to see. So to give you an overview of the major features of Rich's hand-drawn map, Rich identified the wagon wheel gap ice margin, the Grand Gorge ice margin, and the North Blenheim ice margin, along with the Middleburg readvance, as important locations where Catskill glacial ice paused during retreat. But even the zoomed in versions of Rich's hand drawn maps are hard to see, so I'll be using Google My Maps to help visualize Rich's findings. I roughly sketched the movement of glaciers described by the research of Rich, Cadwell, and Titus using Google My Maps. Please note that these maps are to be used as visual cues. They are very generalized sketches of the general movement of ice as the ice ages ended for the Catskills. And keep in mind that there is still ongoing research on the timing and the extent of these vents. And also keep in mind that the man-made features shown on this map did not exist during the ice ages. So you can see Route 209 and the Ashokan Reservoir on this map, but they were definitely not around during the ice ages. However, I think it can be helpful to see these modern day structures sort of as place markers. So I've included them on these maps. So here's a quick walkthrough of how the Catskills thawed out from the ice age as described by the research of Rich, Cadwell, and Titus. As the continental ice sheet began to shrink in size, its terminus or its outer edge moved north. The continental ice sheet retreated further towards the peaks of the eastern escarpment of the Catskills, which we looked at earlier. The ice margin is marked by moraines stretching from Platkill, Platterkill Mountain to Stamford, which you can see noted by the darker blue line on this map. At this time, the Esopus Creek Valley was filled with a solid lobe of ice extending from the larger Hudson Valley ice sheet. And you can see this ice lobe, I sort of drew it in with a, a faint white shade. Um, the ice lobe entirely blocked the Esopus Creek Valley. And as glacial melting continued, the meltwater became dammed between the ice lobe and the valley walls. In a colossal event, the meltwater poured through a gap at the top of the bush kill, rushing into the upper Rondout Creek. The glacial meltwater power washed the landscape and a glacial spillway of meltwater carved into the existing river channel. 
and this process scoured the valley, which, along with other geomorphic processes, resulted in the formation of the Picamus River Gorge. And you can still see the remnants of the powerful glacial spillway in today's upper Rondout Creek. The Picamus River Gorge, which is on the left of this photo, is very steep and pronounced compared to its surrounding landscape and its small underfit stream. So after that, the glacier then experienced minor advances and retreats, causing the ice to jut up against High Point Mountain. And in the space between High Point Mountain and the glacier, a new glacial spillway was formed, creating the wagon wheel gap. Eventually, the Asopus Valley continued to thaw and meltwater cut down into the Beaver Lake spillway. Then the Continental Glacier retreated further back toward the central Catskills. Ice fills the gap in the steep cliff escarpments at Grand Gorge, which you can see here. Trapped between the steep valley walls and the ice jam, the, gla the glacial meltwater flowed through Deep Notch, which is the orange point on the map, and Stony Clove Notch, which is the purple point on the map. The glacial ice advances and retreats several times during this process, and to the south, the behavior of the wagon wheel gap ice margin repeats. Then the Hudson Valley ice sheet advances and pushes lobes of ice to the west into Catterskill Clove. The ice overtopped South Mountain and flowed west along Platkill Clove. At this point, ice had completely, well, almost completely filled the Schoharie Creek Valley, which creates the Grand Gorge Valley Glacier. And this happens because the thinner glacial ice couldn't override the high northeastern and central Catskill escarpments. So the thinner local glaciers poured across Schoharie Creek Valley, completely scouring Gilboa Valley, Prattsville Valley, and Lexington. Eventually, the westward moving ice from Platkill Clove and the Grand Gorge Valley Glacier collide at Mosquito Point, which is the purple point on this map. This process formed the Grand Gorge Ice Margin approximately 16,000 years ago. The continental ice sheet continued to melt, and the ice sheet thinned to be less than 1,500 feet thick. At this point, the ice sheet was lower in elevation than the Grand Gorge Channel, and without being able to flow out of that channel drainage, the waters of the enormous glacial Lake Grand Gorge gradually expand into the Manor Kill, Batavia Kill, and Kaiser Kill Valleys of the central Schoharie Valley. Finally, the Continental Glacier shrank back to the North Blenheim Haynes Falls ice margin. And this is the last known ice margin location before the Continental Glacier drained through the Franklinton Channel and left the Catskill region. The North Blenheim Haynes Falls ice margin symbolized by the brown point on the map here marks the end of the Woodfordian retreat across the Catskill region. The continental ice sheet briefly readvanced the Middleburg position, but eventually it drained through the Franklinton Channel once again. And this is the final instance of continental glaciation in the Catskills. The continental ice sheet had finally scoured its way across the jagged topography and had retreated, leaving the Catskills. And then from about 15 to 10,000 years ago, we see the final stages of the Wisconsin glaciation in the Catskills. Approximately 14,000 years ago, there's a period of maximum melting where Glacial Lake Grand Gorge, all the meltwater carves into the Grand Gorge Gap as the ice retreats for farther north. And then at about 12,000 years ago, we see the Catterskill Clove meltwater carving into Catterskill Falls and Haynes Falls, both of which you can still see today. At approximately 11,900 years ago, plant life begins to reemerge across the Catskills. And this book by Michael Kudish is a great resource for anyone interested in learning more about the development of Catskill forests. And the fossil record shows um, development after the glacier, uh, the development of post-glacial Catskill forests. And the first species we start to see are spruces, hemlocks, birch, and balsam fir trees. So that timeline of events seems like it happened a long time ago, but what's really cool is that today you can still find traces of the chaotic Woodfordian retreat all across the Catskills. 
and chances are you've probably seen the trails of glaciers without even realizing it. The Catskills are a prime location for tracking ancient glaciers. As glaciers move, they leave behind a trail of geologic features, and these features act as clues that allow us to identify the path of ancient glaciers. Steep river gorges, glacial striations, and erratics are some of are some examples of geologic trails left behind by Catskill glaciers. And if you're on a hike in the Catskills and you see any of these features, you can basically look back in time to the Catskill Ice Age. Glacial striations are one of the most common signs of glacial activity that you'll find throughout the entire Catskills. Glacial striations are long, parallel, straight scratches found in solid bedrock. Um, like you can see in these photos here. As glaciers slowly flow, they drag rocks, boulders, and loose sediment along their base. The weight of the massive glacier presses down on the sediment and debris. As the glacier moves, it digs and scrapes the sediment and debris into the ground, creating long parallel scratches known as striations. And these parallel lines give us the orientation of glacial movement. Keep in mind that mountaintop striations give us the most accurate indication of the movement of the continental ice sheet. Striations in, found in the lower valleys of the Catskills often were created by localized ice flow along the minor slopes of the valley walls and valley floor, and they don't necessarily indicate the overall direction of the larger Catskill glacial movement. Also, don't mistake trekking pole scratches for glacial striations. Striations are best identified along flat, smooth stretches of higher elevation Catskill bedrock. Moving on to erratics. Erratics are large boulders that look like they've been dropped out of nowhere, and they're very plentiful throughout the Catskills. Glaciers cause abrasion along rock escarpments, and they erode and transport huge boulders the size of minivans, a process known as plucking. And as the glacier melts, the boulders are deposited oftentimes at locations that make them look misplaced, which is how they got their name erratics. And the mineral composition or the characteristics of erratics often don't match their surrounding landscape. This rock pictured here is a great example of a Catskill erratic. And if you see an erratic, it's likely you're standing near the trail of a glacier. A small, shallow Catskill stream located within a tall, steep, narrow river valley is sometimes an indicator of past glacial activity. Here are some examples found in the Catskills of underfit streams within steep, narrow river gorges. This landscape forms when the meltwater of a glacier becomes dammed between an ice jam and a valley wall. The meltwater pools, forming a massive lake, and, the surf and as the surface of the meltwater rises, the meltwater rapidly flows through a nick point in the topography. The tremendous amount of pressure of the flowing meltwater tears through the nick point and it scours a deep V-shaped channel and creates a very deep and narrow entrenched river channel. This process forms what is, uh, what is known as a glacial spillway. Glacial spillways can be found throughout the Catskills and they often feature oversized waterfalls created during the massive surge of meltwater. And they're referred to by geologists as fossil waterfalls. The presence of fossil waterfalls and river gorges may be a clue that the surrounding landscape was once power washed by the melting waters of a glacier. Fossil waterfalls always have been and continues to be a major attractor for tourists visiting the Catskills. Today, I gave a brief review of Catskill glaciers that I gathered from the texts you see listed here to the left. But new research is constantly being released. Geologists today debate over Catskill glacial history, specifically the timing of the formation of proglacial lakes and the extent of alpine glaciation in the Catskills, just to name two of the contested topics. The Catskills are a worthy location to study glacial activity because the glacial deposits in the Catskills have an enormous effect on the water quality and the water supply. Although glaciers have exited the Catskills, their trails or the sediment pathways and landscape features that the glaciers left behind still have a profound impact on present day Catskills, streams and rivers. 
And here you can see a Catskill stream whose waters are murky from um, disturbed glacial deposits. Glaciers are largely responsible for the Catskills present day surf surficial geology, which is the loose material located above the hard foundational bedrock geology. Catskill surficial geology is made mostly of soil and glacial deposits. Catskill glaciers acted like bulldozers. They broke down the ancient bedrock into sediment, ranging in size from large boulders to fine clay, and then the glaciers deposited the resulting sediment like a thick blanket stretching across the Catskill valleys. After the glaciers left the Catskills, streams got back to work shaping the landscape. The glacial geology surrounding a Catskill stream will influence its present day behavior, its water quality, and its pattern of erosion. And glaciers can drop or deposit sediment in many different ways, creating different types of glacial deposits. And I'll focus on the types of glacial deposits that have been mapped by geologists surrounding the Upper Rondau Creek and the Upper Neversink River. And the first of which is glacial till. Glacial till is unsorted material deposited directly by glacial ice and showing no stratification. And you can see several examples of different types of till in this diagram here. And the till will is unsorted and it'll range from fine clay to boulders and it's formed by the erosion of material carried by the moving ice of the glacier. Uh, the next type of deposit is lacustrine sediment, which is fine clay or silt deposited as streams uh, enter glacial lakes and the fine material settles to the still waters of the lake bottom. And these lakes form as receding glaciers will melt and their meltwater becomes impounded between the ice and a valley wall or a moraine. Um, you can also see moraines. They're another glacial deposit that impact present day Catskill waterways. And moraines, like we talked about, are these mounds of sediment dumped by the glacier's conveyor belt when a retreating glacier lingers at one location. We also see cane, which is a jumbled hill composed of sand, gravel, and till. And the sediment builds up in a depression of ice in a retreating glacier. And then it's dropped irregularly on the land surface once the glacier melts away. We also see outwash plains, and they're formed of glacial sediments deposited by meltwater that flows out in front of a glacier. And these five types of glacial deposits have a profound effect on the present day Upper Rondau Creek and the Upper Neversink River. Here's a map of the present day Rondau and its tributary streams, which I'm sure some of you will recognize some of these names. Um, together, these watershed catchments form the Upper Rondau Creek Basin. This is a map of the underlying bedrock geology of the Upper Rondau Creek. Um, it's sort of hard to see in this photo, but um, the upper Rondau Creek is, consists mainly of the Walton and Oneonta formations, uh, which are made of alternating beds of shales, sandstones, and siltstones. And this map was created during the Rondau Neversink Stream Program's Stream Feature Inventory Walkover. Um, and this is the surficial geology mapped of the upper Rondau Creek. And again, it's also hard to see through zoom, but um, we see a lot of unconsolidated deposits. Um, we see lacustrine clay along the bank toe. We also see lodgement till, which has varied locations. And then we also see along the upper banks of the upper Rondau Creek, we'll see moraine, came terraces, outwash, and till deposits. And these deposits impact the erosional behavior, the sediment supply, and the water quality of the Rondau. So they greatly impact hill slope erosion. Um, along the Rondau, these layers of glacial till contribute to mass wasting hill slope erosion, which is especially common in Rondau Creek's tributary valleys. Um, glacial till layers um, also impact fluvial erosion. 
by resulting in mass slumping, or sometimes you'll see very steepened, nearly vertical strain banks. Um, and you also notice that the lacustrine sediment will become easily mobilized by water here. So during storm events, it's easy to see these murky waters along the rondeau. Uh, next is the upper never sink. And you can see the mapped catchment areas of the main stem, west branch, and east branch of the never sink here. And the bedrock of the Upper Never Sink River consists of Slide Mountain, Honesdale, and Upper Walton formations. And the Upper Never Sink glacial deposits that have been mapped include glacial till, came terraces, and outwash, but there is very minimal to no mapped glacial lake sediment in this watershed. Um, and here, the glacial deposits really impact channel confinement, channel migration, erosional behavior, and water quality. The glacial geology sets the framework for the upper never sink. Uh, the till influences uh, the grade control, so how steep the upper never sink is. Um, and the moraine sediment has a tremendous impact on the channel confinement. So what that means is that there are these areas along uh, the stream where moraines have actually pushed the stream flow against bedrock. Um, and this is sort of visible. And a great example of this is um, the wide valley plains that you see uh, between Fall Brook and Biscuit Brook. Um, we also see that um, meltwater glacial sediment increases the lateral channel adjustments in this watershed, and that's because the meltwater deposits are very easily mobilized by flowing water. Um, so again, we see um, the impact in hill slope erosion. There really isn't a lot of slumping because there isn't any um, of that proglacial lake sediment here. And we see an impact on fluvial erosion because these dense till banks um, often form steep high banks after mass failures. Um, and during the period of glaciation within the Catskills, lots of layers of fine grained clay and silt sediment were deposited by glaciers moving across the landscape. And you also see unstratified deposits here as well. And when these exposed fine grained glacial sediments erode into Catskill streams and rivers, the particles cloud the water, increasing turbidity. And turbidity is just a fancy word for how clear or how murky a water, the waters are. Um, turbidity is the highest concern for Catskill streams water quality. Um, having uh, high sediment content, high fine sediment content in your water can make it unsafe to drink and it has very negative effects on aquatic life. Um, and there's multiple factors that can affect turbidity and other watersheds you can see um, algae development as being a concern for turbidity but for the Catskills glacial sediment is by far the biggest contributor of turbidity. And so when you see murky waters in today's Catskill streams, you're actually looking at the sediment left behind by glaciers during the Ice Age. Um, so how does um, Rondout Never Sink Stream Program protect Catskill waterways from the negative impacts of glacial legacy? Um, Rondout Never Sink Stream Program is dedicated to improving water quality of the Catskill streams. And we include um, measures to improve water clarity um, also, but we also do other programs um, to improve ecological health for the watershed community as well. Um, and some of our uh, supports that we offer are, we conduct stream feature inventories and that's how we got a lot of our sense of where this glacial deposits are along our streams. We also offer channel restoration design. Um, I coordinate the landowner streamside plantings through the Catskill Streams Buffer Initiative program. We offer grant funding for local improvements to infrastructure. And um, we also offer biological stream health flood insurance. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, bi biological stream health, flood hazard mitigation, research funding, and educational content and training. 
And if you want to get involved, uh, just email us at info at or visit our website at rondoutneversync.org.